Ar- Ar- Arjit will join in another 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, welcoming you all, uh, all of you know the subject. So I don't need to uh, talk about what is DCS and what we are trying to do. Uh, only one good which has happened in the last two years of our, one and a half years of our effort is that we, we Bureau of Energy Efficiency, as you know, uh, has started a working group, a, a, a task force. So we already had uh, one meeting of the task force and the minutes are circulated. They have a secretariat which is supported by GIC and AEEE. So some activity as part of a government program, this has moved. Although we are quite upset that uh, uh, the, we are returned to PMO that the new parliament and the new central secretary at Central Vista project should have a DCS. They have considered it, but they have rejected it at the last minute because it will delay the project beyond December 2023 or 24, 23, I think. So they have not done it. They are going with the traditional air conditioning system. And what is more criminal is that they have bought some 30 or 40 megawatt of DG set as backup. So this that, that point also we had taken up very strongly multiple times with the PMO that lithium ion battery should be there. And money is not a constraint for that kind of a massive project at all. And, but despite they all knowing that there is a ban on use of DG set uh, between Octo- October and March, still they are going ahead with that. So this is, these are some of the things in the practical implementation when it happens. So for two, almost two years, I struggled with uh, <coughs> the, the Pradimaidan people for the uh, Arjit has come. So uh, good afternoon, Arjit. So Pradimaidan team and escalated it all the way. Those days, Pradimaidan was under the uh, Commerce Minister Suresh Prabhu. It had come on to his attention also. But by the time they say they have already bought 17, 0.5 megawatt of DG set. It's already delivered by Palenji Mystery through a contract of NBCC and it, we couldn't do anything. So those DG sets are also getting installed in Pragdimai then. So, so this kind of uh, problems, uh, we need to actually bring it to the implementation. In one of my meetings with the uh, uh, NBCC, they said, uh, is lithium-ion battery or battery energy storage system is that in the uh, the CPWD building code? If it is not in the CPWD manual, we cannot uh, include it in the specification. We cannot buy it. So I said, even my grandson time, it may not perhaps come in the CPWD <laughs> manual or in their uh, uh, documents. So these are the things where we need to uh, by by um, law we have to make sure that all new commercial complexes at least or, or, or all new uh, development which happens in smart cities and in other places. All new airports, all the Aero City where actually we are running this show, although it's a virtual thing with lease lines from three, four adjacent meeting rooms we are doing. This Aero City was a great example for a DCS. Uh, now it will be very difficult to <coughs> do one uh, because every building has its own. So any new development, we have to come out with a regulation uh, that if the AC load is above some X uh, quantity, capacity, it has to be a DCS. And, and until such regulations and mandates are not there, it will not. In the EVs, with electric vehicle session also, uh, we've been in our white paper, we have been saying that we have to make certain areas only EV can enter. If you like, you go to Taj Mahal, uh, at least 20 years ago also, about uh, two kilometers away, you have to stop your car and then take one of those, either walk or take one of those uh, electric car rickshaw to go near to the entrance of Taj Mahal. Same way in many places, if you do, for example, the entire center Vista and the new parliament and Connard Place, that area only, entry only for electric vehicles. Automatically things will, we park somewhere else and take a electric rickshaw and go. Or taxis will become more and more Uber and Ola will be there. The option when you book, I should get an option. If you want an electric or you want a <laughs> regular. So this kind of things has to happen mandatorily. So all, all major. There's a very good uh, uh, case study right in front of us, a demonstration. 
it's working very efficiently in gift city and if anybody on the business case is uh, example is right in front of us so the there are building patients and roles in the sector so all of you know uh, the technology the difficulties uh, how it can be done but more we need to talk about the policies and regulations to make it mandatory so that uh, i i have the pleasure of welcoming you all for this uh, workshop and uh, request uh, Ar arjit sen gupta the chair of the uh, session for his opening remarks and uh, hand over to peter for moderating the session thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pillai, and again, uh, I would like to thank the ISGF uh, for organizing this uh, very important roundtable on adoption of district cooling systems in India. And I think uh, you are uh, kind of leading the discussions within the country to kind of enhance the uptake of uh, district cooling in the, I mean, as far as possible. But and we are also kind of now trying to pick in with your efforts and uh, let us hope that with these synchronized efforts in the next uh, few years from now on, we'll be in a position to kind of see some good policies and regulations coming to enhance the uptake of uh, district polling systems in the country. So I would also like to uh, thank the speakers of these sessions. So I can see a very rich panel uh, uh, that we have. So we have Mr. Rajiv Sarma and Ritika Jain, Mr. Kalesh Dhamurthy, Mr. Marcus. Anand will do that. And also introduce, uh, formally introduce all the speakers, including the chair. He has assisted on that. I hand over the uh, machine to uh, Anand. You please come. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Now I will introduce the panel. We will go ahead. Give me a moment. I'll. Welcome everyone once again. Now I'll introduce the panel. Uh, this session is going to be chaired by Sri Arijit Sen Gupta. Uh, Mr. Gupta is director at Bureau of Energy Efficiency Ministry of Power, Government of India. In, in this role, he is responsible for uh, international cooperation, new initiatives and planning and statistics. Uh, apart from this, he is also responsible for coordinating with other ministries on technical matters. He is MBA from Delhi University, certified energy auditor and chemical engineer, having around 15 years of the overall experience of which he has worked on various energy efficiency projects. Our moderator is Mr. Peter uh, Lundberg. Um, Mr. Peter is an energy engineer with 15 years of experience as a team lead, project manager, technical uh, manager, system design and uh, project planner. He has worked and lived in several countries such as Sweden, China, Thailand. He has extensive experience in district heating, district cooling, energy efficiency, renewable energy, demand side management and sustainable urban development. Currently, Mr. Dunberg is the head of operation at Asia Pacific Urban, urban Energy Association in Bangkok, Thailand. He is leading the APUA Secretary to explore, develop, and promote sustainable energy in Asia Pacific region. Welcome, Peter. Uh, our uh, panelist, Mr. Rajiv Sharma, is working as Vice President, Engineering and Construction in Gujarat International Financial Tech City. He has been involved in uh, monitoring of energy and resources strategy development and implementation of 
conservation of energy and resources. He has provided engineering support for utility operations and engineering projects. He, he established a new air quality monitoring and mitigation program for the mission India and supported over 20 other countries in this work. Uh, welcome uh, Rajiv Sharma ji. Our uh, next panelist is uh, Ritika Jain. She is uh, uh, she works as senior program manager with energy efficiency program at Shakti Foundation. Her key focus area includes industrial decarbonization, buildings, and clean cooling. She has previously worked on waste management and circular economy initiatives in India. Ritika was also engaged as a stakeholder engagement trainee with UN office in Bonn, Germany. She holds a master degree in environmental science policy and management from Lund University in Sweden and has completed her engineering degree from Indraprastha University, Delhi. Welcome, uh, Ritika. Our next panelist is Mr. Ganesh Das. Uh, he carries over 30 years of professional experience in the area of technology management, collaboration, partnership, development, strategy, planning, and vision management in the area of power distribution and smart grid technology. Mr. Das is Chief Collaboration, Innovation, and R&D at, uh, at Tata Power, De uh, Delhi Distribution Limited and the Chief Executive Officer of Clean Energy International Incubation Center. He also founded and headed a smart grid, founded and sorry, founded and headed a smart grid group and rolled out one of the country's first advanced metering infrastructure with automated auto demand response project and a comprehensive smart grid technology roadmap for TPTDL. Dr. Das is PhD in the area of strategic marketing and consumer behavior from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, postgraduate in management and LLB from University of Delhi, besides having an executive qualification on sport management from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. Our next panelist is Sri Vikram Murthy, Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He carries 42 years of experience in HVAC industry. He is the director of Univac Environment System Private Limited for unitary and applied HVAC projects and system located at Mumbai. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Mr. Marcus Viper. Marcus carries over 20 years of experience in project management, bilateral and multilateral development, cooperation policy, advisory and strategic planning, telecommunication, energy, environment and climate changes. He is responsible for the implementation of projects, energy transition and DESCOMs a project on distinct cooling within the Indo-German energy program. He leads multidisciplinary team on energy experts and provides advisory services to various stakeholders on penetrative maintenance. Preventive maintenance, demand response, grid integration on, of renewable energy and energy efficient cooling. He has been involved in numerous projects in refrigeration and air conditioning sector. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Rahul Agnihotri. Rahul has been working in energy efficiency renewable energy sector for last 18 years. Rahul has a good understanding of the sector and it is development in India and other countries in Asia. He is, he is closely involved in policy research development of regulatory and institutional framework and assisting central government and state government or sector regulator distribution utility, city municipalities, industries and facility management teams in developing and implementing sustainable policies and projects. He is a good experience. He got good experience in execution of ESCO project and public-private partnership projects. Our last panelist is Mr. Parmeet Gupta. Parmeet is leading the business development of the breed and is involved in market development for commercial scale cooling as a service project. Uh, Invest build own operate to provide central cooling plant and commercial premises. He is CFA level two candidate and experience in real estate investment, integrated development of industrial commercial parks, infrastructure financing, transaction structure, valuations, due diligence procedures, business project strategy. So uh, now I'll uh, um, hand it over to Sri Arijit Sen Gupta. Uh, I'm going to uh, play your uh, presentation, sir. Give, give me a moment. Okay, thank you, Parat. Yeah. So maybe till the time uh, we wait for the presentation to be uploaded, 
just a brief background and that is of course the first slide in the presentation as well and uh, it is regarding the fact that so that how much how the cooling demand is going to rise in the country and uh, if we refer the india cooling action plan then we know that uh, and if we take 2017 as the baseline year 1780 and uh, the total cooling demand in the country uh, was around 120 million uh, tons of refrigeration and as per the icap projections the cooling demand is going to rise to as high as 900 million tier uh, by 2037 2038 that is in the next uh, 20 years from now Uh, yeah, so, uh, less cooling demand in uh, 20, uh, 1780, uh, 65 million tier, and it is projected to rise to as high as 700 million tier uh, by 2037. So almost uh, we can say that uh, around 80 percent of the uh, cooling demand is kind of come from uh, space cooling in buildings. Next slide, please. And uh, with this background, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, another thing, move to the next slide, please. Yeah. And with this background, uh, and also uh, based on the recent announcements. Uh, which have been made uh, in the COP 26 uh, deliberations held in Glasgow, where Honourable Prime Minister has mentioned uh, about the Panjamrit uh, goals. And uh, if we look at uh, the Panjamrit uh, goals, the three uh, deliberations of directly to efficiency in one way or the other. So, Panjamrit of reducing CO2 emissions. By one billion ton by 2030, from now onwards. Second is uh, achieving net zero by uh, 2070, and third is of course uh, getting uh, the with uh, 50 percent of the total generation from the renewable energy. So all these uh, somehow uh, link uh, to um, energy efficiency. And uh, if we have to achieve the net zero goals uh, by 2070, and of course the uh, one thing that we and also because of the higher income levels but at the same time we have to ensure that this rise in pulling demand happens sustainably and uh, one of the way to achieve this uh, And uh, so ICAP has already, and we can also kind of uh, uh, through the system, also promote the use of words, which are um, difficult to uh, in case of uh, having other police like ICAP conditions and others. And then there are of course uh, other advantages uh, to it as well. And as mentioned. In the opening marks as well, district cooling is already happening in India, and we have from uh, engineering and construction of deep city, and of course we will deliberate uh, detail on the benefits and the tool uh, due to the district cooling system that has been placed uh, in deep city. Next slide, please. So to promote the uptake of district cooling systems in India, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the GIZ will also again have Mr. Marcus uh, who is. Uh, Leading the project from the GIZ side along with the BWD, uh, so we have uh, kind of developed we have developed a project, and uh, these are the three outputs of this project. So the first output is basically to uh, see how to kind of uh, encourage partners 
to understand more about the technical and economic solutions. Then include them into the technology pillar in this opening demand. So the key here would be to include the solutions which are already known to a certain degree to each of us into the solutions. Yeah, previous slide, please. Yeah. So uh, the second output is, of course, then once the technical uh, and economic solutions are known to the partners, then the second output is to kind of come up with viable business models and uh, so that the uptake happens uh, at a faster uh, pace. And then we also have a plan to kind of uh, develop some sort of a, uh, an application uh, to incentivize these whole things to TCF or J funding. Yeah, next, please. Uh, can you move? Yeah. So this is the, some benefits of uh, the technology. I mean, this is again something which is already known to you. I mentioned about the NDC goals, the climate commitment that India already has. Yeah, apart from that, we also have to adhere to the Kigali Amendment uh, commitments, which uh, is the requirement of uh, low GWP and non-ODS based refrigerant. Again, something which uh, can be easily availed uh, through the district cooling systems. I, we have also talked about the India Cooling Action Plan, the Paris Paris Agreement, and it is linked to a uh, number of sustainable development goals as well. Coming to the key benefits, of course, it avoids the capital cost of installing uh, chillers and cooling towers. It also helps to kind of aggregate the cooling needs of multiple buildings. And I think this is an area uh, I mean, where the market development uh, can take place. For example, uh, we have recently heard uh, in the recent budget announcement, the Honorable uh, Finance Minister talking about uh, energy savings through uh, innovative uh, business models like the energy savings service company mode or the ESCO mode. So this is an area where the ESCOs can also find uh, something, uh, I mean, something very encouraging because uh, they are aggregating the putting demands of multiple buildings. Then of course, uh, we also can see that if we are able to adopt DCS technology, then uh, we are able to uh, kind of create, uh, I mean, the same more than 50% of the peak electricity demand. And also the peak demand from the grids are avoided. And uh, we can also ensure a more effective refrigerant management and operation through the uptake of DCS technology. Yeah, next please. Now, uh, I mean, in the next slide, I will, uh, I'm just showing you the, the various uh, uh, initiatives that has already been undertaken. Previous slide, please. So, uh, the first example that I'm referring to is that of the, the, the gift city. Of course, I'm not going to deliberate too much into it. Because Mr. Rajiv Sharma is already here, so he will be able to kind of give us more details about the project. We also have uh, the DLF Cyber City uh, example uh, in Delhi with us. And the Amravati project and the UNEP project, of course, Mr. Rahul is also here, Rahul Agniotri. I understand that he will also speak about uh, the UNEP endeavors, where he, can, he will cover both the Amravati and the UNEP district energy systems. And uh, so I, I will not uh, spend too much time on this slide. Instead, uh, I request Anand, if you can move to the next slide, please. So, I mean, we are in touch with various uh, stakeholders uh, for this project. I mean, of course, again, uh, CPWD is a key stakeholder. And, of course, we are trying to pursue them that at least in one of their new upcoming projects, DCS is employed. And that is uh, something which we are doing. We al already had meetings with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. We already have, we are, I mean, we are also in touch with NBCC. Uh, of course, MOFCC and the Ministry of Power, they are very much on board. And uh, we are trying to kind of have a uh, uh, web workshop uh, very soon involving the financial institutions, the knowledge partners who will be the facilitators for this project, and also the key implementers like the design consultants, the developers, the technology providers, and the system integrators. Uh, we wish to have a, a physical workshop, that's why uh, there was some delay. Uh, because of this uh, situation, the COVID situation in the country, but now I think uh, we can organize a, a workshop and uh, we have already kind of prepared a, a committee also, a technical committee has been constituted and one meeting of the technical committee has already happened. I think most of the panel members who are in, today in this panel are members of the technical committee as well. We have received your inputs and we have incorporated your inputs. So next slide, please. 
So uh, the technical committee has been formed basically to develop these uh, district pooling guidelines, which will act as kind of a precursor uh, to the district pooling board, and uh, which I feel uh, will enable the uptake of policies in the country, which is pertaining to the district uh, uh, pooling systems. Next slide, please. So there are uh, the, which coming to the purpose and objective of the guidelines or the district pooling board, which we are trying to develop. So, of course, the first objective is that how can uh, district pooling contribute to the overall uh, goal of net zero and ICAP implementation. Also, we would like to build the capacity and enhance the knowledge of uh, DCS, uh, not only uh, on the, I mean, on the, among the government stakeholders, but also the private stakeholders. Then also we would like to come up with some uh, minimum specifications and requirements of a DCS project. And for this purpose, we are trying to kind of find out a, a site or a good location where we can uh, take up a viable project and we can showcase that this is the these are the benefits of DCS project. And uh, then we also like that uh, we also expect that these guidelines uh, will be used by the city development authority and uh, should will be injected in a, a city development plan or the master plan. So this was this was the overview that I, I intended to give, uh, give uh, during this uh, session, and I expect that uh, we'll have a much more uh, a richer discussion, and we'll have much more uh, richer kind of inputs uh, to how to kind of further streamline our program, how to further uh, ensure that this uh, the concept of district pooling system is adopted and accepted by the major stakeholders in the country. Uh, I will pause here and I would uh, hand it over back to Anand and uh, to Peter, of course, uh, for the moderated panel discussion. But thank you once again very much uh, for your patient hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ajiji. Now I'll invite Mr. Peter Lundberg to um, formally uh, start moderating the session. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Anand, and thank you very much, Ajit, for the introduction, as well as uh, Mr. Reji Kumar uh, for giving uh, welcome remarks. So, hello, everyone. My name is Peter Lundberg, and I'm the currently the Executive uh, Director at the Asia Pacific Urban Energy Association, or APUEA. So, I am happy to be your moderator today uh, to moderate this uh, roundtable discussion on DC cooling, uh, including uh, business models, regulatory, regulatory support, and also a rollout of district cooling systems in India. And I'm, I'm very happy to have with me today uh, seven experts to share their thoughts on DC cooling developments in India. So uh, we already had an introduction to uh, the panelists. So. Uh, I think I will go ahead with with the sessions and uh, with with the questions. And uh, uh, I also want to inform that um, we have got uh, a few presentations. So we have, uh, as far as I know, maybe we have more, but there are three presentations also uh, from the panelists. So I will start uh, to give the word to Mr. Vikram Murthy from uh, Ishre to for him to share his presentation and. Uh, have a little discussion with him after that. Uh, let's start with you. the floor is yours, Vikram. I think you're muted. Vikram, can you hear me? Um, uh, uh, Mr. Vikram, can you hear us? Y you are on mute. Kindly, kindly unmute yourself.
Okay, now. Yes. Okay. Very good. So I'll be very quick with a just with just a few slides, and I'll be happy to answer questions after that. So this is my presentation, and let me just put it in PowerPoint mode, and I hope I can do that very quickly. So this is taking very long to happen. So I'll just go forward. For all the library, the offices, the, the lecture halls and the laboratories, and the diversity was able to make that plant operate with only 1000 tons. Uh, I live in Bombay and uh, there's 20,000 tons of unitary air conditioners in the complex where I live, which would have been ideal uh, uh, site for doing district cooling. And indeed, that would have really brought down the, the consumed load to just in 5,000 tons because uh, I have been witness to residential district cooling, or shall we say very large central cooling systems in Hyderabad, which also use uh, thermal storage. And they have brought the, the cooling load, which could have been 4,000 tons to just 1,000 tons. To see the maximum benefits of doing residential district cooling. So on this topic of residential cooling, I wish to say, and we have heard from the speakers before us, uh, that as per the uh, India Cooling Action Plan, 70% of air conditioning in India is residential. It will continue to be that. We must be mindful of that. 30 years from now, there might be six times growth, but it will be 70% residential. So that's a huge opportunity to look at district cooling for large uh, complexes and so on. I think that's very important to learn. Uh, the other thing which I was bringing about in my presentation was the technologies which must aid district cooling and more of that if I'm asked a question. So I wish to say that very large Delta T is very important. The use of highly efficient uh, heat exchangers is very important. The design of the air handling units to be uh, using this high Delta T is very important. So these are all the things which uh, would really be my background for district cooling to be implemented in India. What can catalyze district cooling, where it can be applied very well, and, uh, and various things which bring in all of this are very important. I just wish to touch upon one uh, important matter for us to note, that why isn't district cooling happening more naturally in India? It is because we don't have large enough mixed use spaces which are forming naturally. I think that's a very important social thing to note. Uh, when societies get together, when there is, when there is a huge amount of uh, cultural diversity, when there's a huge amount of acceptance of all sorts of people in one place, regardless of their race, religion, culture, language, that's the city of Hyderabad, for example. The city of Delhi is not bad. The city of Calcutta is not bad. So these cities will continue to attract people who want to live together. There must be entertainment. There must be bars. I'm just saying things out of context. But this is very important to see why Singapore has more district cooling and why India has less district cooling. We must rise up to the social needs of bringing people together in multi-use projects of entertainment, schools, living together. We must worry about thermal comfort for all which district cooling can provide. So I will end over here uh, so that... Uh, we can hear the other people as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vikram, for that. Um, I will continue with a few questions uh, uh, to you directly here, and I think in in, in regards to what you what you said, uh, I think it's very interesting to hear uh, the potential for district cooling, and also uh, you share your thoughts on district cooling on residential complexes, and and um, you also mentioned you know the benefits of having mixed-use com complexes to, to utilize load sharing and things like that. So, um, I mean, how important is, is it then for a district cooling system to, to, uh, to have a mixed-use load? Uh, or do you think it's possible to, to, uh, to have uh, large residential complexes using district cooling only? How, how do you see the, the complexity in this? So I see the complexity only as one main thing, and that is the developer. The developer must feel fully uh, convinced that the district cooling model will benefit his buyer. 
So the buyer must see the benefit which has been sold as an anthem, as something he believes in, as, as truly the big benefit of buying a house in that residential area, as mm -hmm. the driver for that development. And that is happening in Hyderabad in a very big way. Uh, because the developers have understood that district cooling will be purchased by people because they get cooling as a service. Imagine removing all the headache of maintaining your air conditioner. Everybody has five or six air conditioners. He struggles every summer to maintain them. He has high bills. And if cooling as a service is as easy as opening the tap and you convince people that's the way, they will go for residential cooling. I am very sure that uh, this is a growth sector. It is also the most important sector because it's 70% of our air conditioning uh, application. It will happen. Do you see so an incre increased awareness of this cooling for uh, real estate developers? I don't see that yet because the real estate developer is only interested in quick turnover of his property into sale. And because district cooling involves technology and time, uh, it will take some effort of a consultant who is very well attached with the developer to do that. So there are large organizations which can do that, such as uh, the, the people who build whole cities of India, like uh, there's a Mahindra, uh, a new city is growing in many parts of India, which would be ideal district cooling projects because one developer does the whole city. It's a mini city. So that's the people we have to educate. All right. So there are plenty of things to do still yes. to advocate for right. district cooling. Just one last question here before I move to the next speaker here. Uh, and I know this, this is, a, is, is some of your expertise here. So can you give some um, examples of technical uh, innovations that... Uh, uh, is going that, that can reduce energy consumption by oh, utilizing yes. this cooling. Yeah, this is something uh, Ishray, the society uh, I'm involved with. Uh, we have a, a district uh, cooling or district energy systems a technical group and Rahul Agni 3 is also a member. We have members from EESL and so on. So I will be very quick with that. So I see that thermal storage is a very important matter because you can cool at night at cheaper loads and use that energy. Uh, in the morning and that that is there in the uh, district cooling plants in hyderabad residential building very high delta t that's a standard now it's a national standard that you must have uh, 15 degrees fahrenheit seven and a half degrees centigrade difference between entering water and leaving water and the return water must not return at temperatures below 12 degrees centigrade that's very important to bring down energy consumption of the chiller and we must use alternate energy we must use solar energy for all the pumps we can have uh, those heat exchangers with pumps for each building and those building pumps must be solar driven. So that you will just shave off all the energy over there and uh, solar with battery. So you can operate at any time. So that's very important. Uh, I've also talked about uh, very highly efficient heat exchangers. Then one very important thing is the automatic coming on and off of the cooling. That must be occupancy sensor driven. So even in the home, I'm in a home now, there's only me over here. If I forget to put off the air conditioner, it will go off because of an occupancy sensor. And the, all of this will happen to save energy. And the last one, of course, is control systems. Make people informed. Make them uh, in charge of their control. And that will also aid a lot of all of this. That's right. what, what I would like to say for this. Yes. Right. Uh, just one thing that came to my mind there. I mean, a possibility for this cooling is to use uh, a natural... Uh, sources as heat sinks such as rivers or uh, lakes, oh, yes. sea water. So Wonderful. how do you see the potential for that in, in India? Yes, I see that. So the first example I gave of the Baba Atomic Research Center in Bombay, it was done in 1955. India was an atomic whatever country so many years ago. Not bomb, but uh, nuclear applications of atomic energy. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, peaceful applications. So over there, the cooling is into the big sea, which is just behind the Atomic Research Center. The sea is the heat sink. So that's a wonderful discharge. Rivers must be flowing if you want to use them. Most of our uh, thermal plant generation is using of water which is close by. And so in the city like Hyderabad, I'm taking this example very often, there are huge big lakes, very big lakes. We must be careful of not disturbing the biodiversity of what lives inside the water. But that's a very good way of doing cooling. And uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it's a great idea. Right. But do you think there are many uh, obstacles, regulatory obstacles, in terms of uh, 
uh, utilizing this water because you're basically heating up. Um, even if it's very, very little, you're heating up. Ah, so we must, know, we must know what we are doing. And there's a, there are river authorities in India, the marine authorities. There are many authorities, but we can break past all this by getting mm -hmm. data. What will you do and what will happen? So there must yeah. be good studies on that. And uh, if that's all done and it's proven well, it can be. So you must regulate the temperature of water which goes inside that cold water. It should yeah. not be higher than like that. So, so it can all be done, certainly. Okay. Certainly, Thank you, the, cost line, the last point is, we have a 7,500 uh, kilometer coastline. So there are lots of water around us, which is the ocean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vikram, for sharing these thoughts. Yeah. Um, uh, stick around as long as you can. I know that you have to leave a bit early, uh, but uh, you stick around. So uh, the next speaker I would like to uh, move to is Mr. Rahul uh, Agnitor Hotri for from uh, UNEP. I also I was also told that he uh, was a little bit in a hurry. So I would like to move to to you, Rahul. Are you hello? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Peter, for considering my uh, request. Actually, yeah. I am sitting at the airport, so please excuse me if there is any background noise. Uh, good afternoon yeah. to everyone. Yeah, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me start off by thanking ISGF for inviting me for this wonderful session. And I could see many of the fellow speakers whom we have been working from last five, six years in district cooling, trying to promote district cooling, not only in India, but in uh, other parts of the world uh, through our district energy and cities program. Uh, and uh, in India, as you all know, that we started district building work uh, with energy efficiency services and Clay South Asia. And then we keep on adding partners like Ishray, who are as a leader of energy efficiency, and uh, Tabri, and the list go on. So I'm, uh, I'm so happy to see that uh, the progress. Uh, on district cooling is happening. Although uh, district cooling in India is a very new technology, uh, but it is the most influential technology if we uh, want cities to decarbonize uh, given the roadmap uh, suggested by the government of India. So district cooling will play a very important role in that. And as mentioned by Arijit and uh, uh, Vikram sir, that uh, cooling demand is going to rise in cities uh, as per the India Cooling Action Plan, and therefore, district uh, cooling would always be contribution to use uh, among the various other conditioning options available. And we have been striving for that, and uh, because of that, we we started off with few pilot projects, and I'm happy to tell that. Uh, UNEP had made a small contribution in uh, developing a district cooling system for Hyderabad Pharma City. Uh, the tender is already out, and uh, it is, uh, I think, one of the largest district cooling project in India, uh, not only in India, but South Asia. The total capacity envisaged is 125,000 TR, and it's a PPP model. So, uh, as uh, highlighted by uh, Arijit, the business model becomes a very important factor. And uh, Vikram Murthy sir suggested that cooling as a service model could be the best model to be adopted for implementing district cooling project. So this tender is based on the, this cooling as a service model. And uh, I'm sure many of uh, the big uh, uh, district cooling developers will uh, apply for this tender and we will see a lot of participation from the other organizations like Tata Power or Adami who are into the utility business. So uh, with that, uh, I think uh, let me also highlight some of the very important factors uh, because the technology of district cooling is evolving. Uh, it started off with uh, a pure electrical chiller, then vapor absorption system, then thermal storage system, then integration of uh, uh, new technologies like renewable energy, solar rooftop, uh, uh, waste energy, uh, waste to energy means waste heat uh, from industries and thermal power plants. Uh, uh, it is now using the uh, waste water as well uh, as one of the source for cooling uh, in cooling tower. 
So I think uh, as the technology evolves, uh, more and more new models, uh, business models will start emerging. And therefore, uh, the very uh, uh, startups and the banks needs to be brought into this uh, discussions because uh, I really feel that startups uh, really change the entire uh, game of uh, service delivery if they are properly handhold and if they are properly financed and uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and ESL uh, promotes a small SL for uh, the facility management companies uh, and use them to promote district pooling, uh, it would really become a game changer in India. And as we all know that district cooling contributes to 40% of overall energy consumption. Of, I mean, pooling contributes to 40% of overall energy consumption of the city. Pooling will definitely become a major factor for electrical utilities uh, going forward. And I think it is there where uh, Tata Power, Adani, and many of the private uh, discounts like Torrent Power are very well placed because they are vertically integrated. Uh, they have uh, it's a Tata Power, they have Tata Capital to finance, they have Tata Reality uh, to take this project forward. So uh, I think uh, if such vertically integrated companies uh, can showcase some of the pilot projects uh, in large cities on district cooling, it will definitely help us uh, uh, help us build a better business model and it will also help us uh, to overcome some of the initial barriers which we identified in our district pooling potential assessment study. And I'm very happy that uh, GIZ and uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency are uh, taking a lot of efforts uh, and trying to implement uh, some of the recommendations of the district pooling potential assessment study that uh, we did with Energy Efficiency Services Limited. And uh, I think uh, uh, many of the speakers also highlighted on the policies and regulatory aspects. So yes, uh, cities needs to incorporate uh, district pooling in their master planning, in their urban planning, new area development plans, and also city needs to uh, uh, provide that support for developers to, uh, come, uh, to come and build up this project on PPP models. So cities has a major role in uh, promoting district pooling projects. And many of the cities are realizing this and uh, they need uh, some kind of handholding, awareness, training and capacity building. And that is what uh, UNEP along with Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the GIZ and all our partners in India would like to do in future. We also would support uh, in uh, support MOEFCC in developing some of the regulatory mechanisms like uh, MOEFCC when uh, a large uh, city uh, development plan comes to them for environment clearances. If they incorporate uh, uh, assessment of district cooling as the mandatory measures in such large uh, city area development plans, then it would uh, really become a mandatory clause for cities to look at uh, district pooling as one of the options. And uh, many of the smart cities, uh, like for example, uh, the Rajkot smart city has uh, in its policy that uh, the, new, uh, the new smart city that is coming up will have a district pooling plant and it is mandatory for end consumers to connect to district pooling plant and not use any other technology. So these are some of the initiatives, I think, uh, which uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, GIZ, and uh, uh, the team will uh, promote. Of course, we are also in the technical group and this technical group will see that uh, all the practical measures uh, that can be adopted for district pooling are uh, covered into the guideline document which Bureau of Energy Efficiency is preparing. And the business models along with the contractual agreements and uh, the legal aspects of the contracts uh, will cover uh, all the relevant clauses so that the private parties come forward uh, to take up such kind of uh, challenging projects and uh, particularly the utilities. I'm again focusing on the electrical utilities. They need to be a part of this and it will be a game changer uh, for the entire cooling sector. With this, I would like to end uh, over to you. Uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Rahul, for that update. And uh, uh, you, UNEP, are doing a very good work and has been doing, you know, you are very, doing a very good job to uh, uh, promote and to develop district cooling in, 
projects in India. And one one more question, maybe one last question here before I move on and and let you go. How do you how do you feel you know in your work now in capacity building and and training of training cities supporting cities in district cooling? How do you see that awareness is changing? Is it is it are cities more aware of district cooling and the benefit? That comes with it. Uh, see, uh, I I can't see that, uh, say that all the cities are aware, but uh, definitely some of the smart cities, the progressive smart cities, uh, are now uh, at least knowing what is district pooling. And thanks again to Bureau of Energy Efficiency (ESL) partner like Apua and Ishray, uh, the technology. Uh, is spreading by mouth and people are able to know what the technology is and how it can be used in cities. Uh, and also like uh, as a next step under the UNEP program, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to develop a challenge for 100 cities. Uh, and uh, this is along with uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, uh, NIUA, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and various partners. And this challenge will definitely uh, not only focus on district cooling, but uh, it is about the urban heat mitigation. And this urban heat mitigation it would include various uh, technologies, including district cooling. Those technologies could be thermal comfort through building energy efficiency, uh, cool roof program, uh, the nature-based solutions. So this pro uh, program we are going to launch soon. And uh, uh, initially, the pilot will be done in two lighthouse cities. One of them is Chennai. Uh, and uh, subsequently, we will scale it up to 10 cities and further to 100 cities. So uh, I take this opportunity in the forum to uh, inform about this new project. We be planning to uh, start it from next month. So with this, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Rahul. This is, is a very good initiative and urban urban uh, heating uh, and, and the heat heat urban effect is 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 going to be uh, worse uh, with climate change. So that's a very important thing. Uh, just one last question, sorry. Do, do you have any uh, link or where, where uh, let's say the viewers or anyone can find more information on the tender that you mentioned for the district cooling project in uh, Hyderabad, right? Is there some link or something for uh, so to Peter, learn more about this? Uh, I have got the link. I will send it to you by email. I'm big okay. I'll send you the link, yeah. Okay. For, for the tender, yeah. Okay. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you very much, Rahul, for your your input, and uh, I hope you have a good flight uh, here soon. Thank you, Peter. All right. Um, I would like to move on to the next speaker, uh, Marcus Whippier from uh, JIZ. Hello, Marcus. I, I was told that you, you have a presentation as well. Yes, I do, and I'm just about to share it. I hope it is visible, is it? Yes. And can you see it also in the full mode? Yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for giving me the floor, and thanks a lot to ISGF for also uh, inviting us to this important session and uh, thanks also to Arijit uh, to already introduce the project uh, which we are doing and uh, yeah I would say we are all somehow uh, trying to improve the framework conditions for district cooling here everyone who is uh, on the panel and uh, I think the uh, establishment of the technical committee uh, end of last year, that was really a major milestone also to bring all those who are working on the uh, promotion of district cooling uh, in India together. And I'm really expecting that we are now, when we are coming out of the pandemic, uh, making good and fast progress. Uh, the session uh, was on business models, regulatory support, uh, and rollout of DCS. So I have actually uh, tried to focus on the business models part. Uh, and later I will also tell a little bit about the uh, district cooling guidelines, which Arijit already mentioned. So business models, uh, it's maybe a little bit uh, theoretic here. 
uh, but uh, we have tried to structure it with what kind of contracting models are actually there and uh, looking at the international best practices in principle one can break it down into a single off taker concession model uh, so where you have a single off taker who enters into a cooling as a services agreement with a district cooling provider and uh, then purchases the district cooling plants entire capacity on an availability model basis. Uh, and a, a typical concession arrangement is that you have a builder developer who engages a district cooling provider, then the builder finances the construction of the plant, permits the provider to offer district cooling services to the end users. Uh, and here you have actually in this arrangement uh, that the builder ensures that the end users purchase the district cooling from the appointed provider. So we heard that also already a little bit in the previous uh, contribution speeches um, that, yeah, it needs then to be assured that those who are living in the uh, building area where you have the district cooling plant somehow uh, need to be bound by contractual agreements. Uh, it cannot be that then uh, you have to still compete uh, with people running their split air conditioners uh, and, and having, let's say, the free choice to either opt in or out, I think that would not make it viable. So these are, of course, then important preconditions. Uh, then you also have the cooling as a service uh, model, and, and this is then a pay-per-service model. Uh, it eliminates the component of the upfront investment cost for the uh, builder and developer. Uh, and then also for the customers, of course, and then you have a technology provider. He needs to be incentivized to install and maintain the most efficient equipment possible. But of course, we also have to understand that uh, this is then uh, a long term agreement. It probably is for 30 years. So we, we are actually creating a monopoly here. And yes, that needs regulatory uh, oversight, uh, so that uh, not uh, in the beginning, yes, the most energy efficient uh, system has been uh, built, but then over time, uh, the customers are, let's say, getting exploited uh, and, and could not actually uh, take any measures against it. it. We, of course, need to make sure that they also benefit from any advances in the technology, any savings. Uh, and uh, also that, of course, the uh, service provider has a continuous interest in improving the services, but the benefits should be shared so that the uh, uh, consumers also uh, yeah, benefit from that. So just to put it a bit more, uh, oops, it's, it's not moving. My, ah, no, it's moving, yeah. So just... A little bit more detailed yeah here this is again the single off taker model so the system is designed directed commissioned and operated by private sector uh entrepreneur and there is actually little or no role of the the government and uh, yeah good examples we have from other areas uh, is building facility management operators um uh, who do that internet cable operators etc et, et um yeah, the, 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 in principle, the setup is, is fine, but the nitty gritties, I will come to that a little later, that is that there has to be a conducive environment which enables now all these three agents to interact uh, in, in an uh, seamless way and without interruption. Um, yeah, here, just again, we have that... Um, the, the uh, government-owned single off-taker model. So here then the urban local body in its role as the local authority or public utility has the full ownership of the system that of course allows for complete control. Uh, examples are water and sewerage boards, discoms, smaller city airports, uh, and so on. So uh, this, this is another way and uh, Okay, it takes a little bit of time to change these slides. Is it changing or not? Um, somehow it doesn't react. Uh, yeah, maybe you can restart the... Yeah, I, I just try it again. Uh, it, can you see it? Yes. 
Okay, so this this should be this slide should show hybrid model. Does it say hybrid model? Yes. Okay, good. So that is the uh, yeah an SPV special purpose vehicle. So here there you have a concession contract. There the public sector is involved in the design and the development of the project, but then it's developed, financed, and operated by the private sector. Uh, the city usually has the option to buy back the project in in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, these are also, let's say, typical models as you find it in airports, um, utilities, water supply projects, etc. Et um, yeah, the the crux, as I said, is uh, you have to have a level playing field uh, where you can compete with others. So in India, for example, the tariffs can become an issue as you have residential electricity tariffs, but uh, then let's say the service provider of the district cooling plant needs to procure the electricity uh, to run the plant at the commercial tariff, which is higher than the residential tariff. So are, these are of course then some barriers uh, which uh, yeah, need to be overcome. Uh, I think that's what, what we all need to work on that we really have an equal living level playing field. Uh, similar is for water. Uh, then also for the construction. Uh, there are some bylaws where one needs to have a closer look. Uh, and yeah, also, as mentioned before, it's it's uh, not so easy to, let's say, bind all the uh, consumers, tenants, or owners of buildings uh, into such an agreement and, and make it uh, then mandatory for them. Or, you have to also give uh, guarantees then that that uh, the regulatory framework uh, is working and that people trust into it. I think that's that's still something uh, apart from awareness for the district cooling technology. We also need to build trust in general that that people accept cooling as a service provided uh, by a utility uh, in India. That is still I think not guaranteed uh, and people prefer to install their individual systems because they don't want to be dependent on um, central provided services as they have made perhaps not so good experiences in the past. So uh, we have to actively tell people it's it's a benefit if it's run by professionals and, and that if they can provide it uh, as uh, a large scale uh, centrally uh, run on organized service because then all the benefits accrue. Um, and, and, and yeah, that this, it has to be set in good examples. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this topic. Uh, I'm trying again to move the slides. Uh, probably I have to do it manually because now I wanted to just uh, spend a few moments on the uh, guidelines which we are developing right now, but unfortunately the, uh, oh, okay, now it's working. The presentation was hanging. Is it showing now the uh, district cooling guidelines slide? <clears throat> yes, yes. Okay, great. But okay. It's, it seems to be, uh, okay, now, now we see it. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so what is the, uh, yeah, the objectives and purpose of the guidelines? That is the, the first chapter also. Uh, so here we, we will focus on uh, how the district cooling can contribute to the net zero and ICAP implementation in the cooling action plan. Uh, what knowledge enhancement is required? What are minimum specifications, requirements of district cooling projects? How can it be used by city development authorities, developers and others? And how can it be uh, connected to the city development plans or the master plans? Then uh, the guidelines will describe the district cooling system, uh, components, how has it evolved, the history, key stakeholders, stakeholder assessment, and then uh, have a specific mentioning of the Indian context. Um, then we will describe the key components. Uh, that means uh, how distinguish DCS from just, uh, let's say, central cooling systems and standalone building. Uh, then what are the different stages here uh, in district cooling 
technology is DCS plant side distribution network and user side, and also how to control and monitor the system. Uh, then probably chapter four, that will be the most exhaustive and probably also the key uh, chapter here. How are the general procedures for DC project development? And uh, that means the rapid assessment methodology, which uh, also UNEP has been following in, 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 in the projects in India so far. Site-specific deep dive assessment, further uh, feasibility study methodology, and the business case development. Then uh, we will look into designing, construction and commissioning. So the cooling node estimation, the key performance indicators, uh, then operation and maintenance, system upgrade, and uh, last but not least decommissioning. You need to think that from the very beginning. Um, and there are also performance indicators for operation uh, and, and system and fault diagnostic. Then, uh, yeah, how to evaluate? Uh, there, there are some uh, uh, indicators for the for the projects: the minimum size, the minimum build-up area, the length of the network, cooling load density. Uh, then, in regards to the business development, uh, yeah, we, we need an enabling policy mechanism, and it needs to cover and address those issues which I just mentioned. I'm sure there are more. Maybe we will learn a bit more also when Rajiv Sharma from Gibbs City uh, will, will present uh, as they already uh, probably face some of those issues. And uh, yeah, we are working with the Bureau also on a district cooling act, uh, and, and that of course should be built on the guidelines, but it also needs to be based on the experience of everyone already working on the ground so that we have those lessons learned built in and we need to develop the, the business models. Uh, yeah, then we will have some case studies and FAQs as well. And uh, yeah, it's coming out very soon. So I think in within this month, uh, first, of course, it goes through a peer review of the technical committee, and uh, then we will incorporate all the inputs from the technical committee, and then we, we, we will publish it, or the Bureau will publish it. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, um, I'm, I've put my, my email ID here as well, so if you have any questions directly to me later, uh, you are most welcome to uh, send me a mail. Back to uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that comprehensive presentation on uh, on the upcoming report on guidelines. This, this I think, is highly anticipated, and uh, we look forward to to, to read it. Um, I think you. I mean, it's very comprehensive, as I mentioned. So, uh, just maybe you can stay with us a little bit to to discuss some questions. Marcus, are you there? Yes, I'm very much there. Sorry, uh, I okay. guys of the video also. I think not only the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, thank you for that presentation. That's that's really good. That's, <clears throat> what do you think? I mean, in your experience now, in both your project and and all the, uh, let's say, uh, capacity building and and what are the key challenges when it comes to district cooling? Uh, is it you know related to technology, business models, awareness uh, in terms of, I think it is a policy issue. Um, yeah, do you have any uh, update on that? Yes, I think uh, a major barrier still is that uh, yeah, many regulations, uh, it was mentioned also, I think in the beginning, um, still do not allow are for taking up new technologies. So there, there are still some, let's say, decade old, uh, decades old uh, bylaws and and uh, yeah, guidances. Uh, this definitely needs a change. Or uh, it's even still what we have encountered that when when uh, there is government building residential buildings, uh, air conditioning is not included. Our thermal comfort is not yet included. There are, let's say, improvements, but still, in principle, there is there is no uh, uh, thinking of it from the very beginning, which uh, means that all the residents in that 
residential area are actually doomed to uh, use split air conditioners in the future because there is no provision for centralized cooling and it will be very expensive uh, to to bring it in at a later stage if it's not from the beginning and and there are many many new townships which are coming up and still are we always get to hear yeah for the commercial part for the for for the commercial buildings in that area yes we we think of the cooling uh, but then again uh, they think of the traditional cooling single standalone chillers etc and for the residential nothing and i think that that really needs to change uh, because otherwise people are also deprived of any innovation and 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 will have to stick to the split air conditioners. And India is still having a very low penetration of air conditioners. It's below 10%. Uh, but if we see the economy, economy growing like it is predicted, just 9% 9 9 growth in this year only. Um, uh, and, and, and if it continues like this, uh, you can just imagine how much more uh, cooling demand will come up. And, that cannot be met only with split air conditioners in the future. Um, but we have to have an enabling environment for district cooling, and uh, that has to start at the planning level. So for the master plans uh, for, for the urban local bodies, they need to bring it in from the very beginning. Uh, and then also all the uh, organizations like CPWD, NBCC, they need to uh, have that sense that they should do the feasibility study from the beginning only if it really doesn't uh, count out if it doesn't really fit uh, then okay it should be discarded but uh, right now it's very difficult to bring in this recording because uh, whenever the planning happens uh, usually then the traditional uh, ways uh, already will will prevent district cooling from coming in. So I think we still need to talk a lot to the urban local bodies, to the planners, but also to the organizations. We still need to do uh, very specific trainings. I mean, we, I think it still needs to be tailored. We need to really understand uh, two things here. One is, okay, what do we want the people to do once they got trained? We should not just do the draining per se, that also will not help. We really need to speak to the people, understand where can we meet their requirements. Then we need to understand what we want them to do, what they are able to do. And then we need to help them with training to get there. And, and I think this, this is really still very specific. Each project is still different and uh, yeah, it needs a lot of talking. It needs a lot of support, hand-holding, and uh, yeah, only together who all are in this room right now uh, and, and the organizations behind can achieve that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Thank you, Marcus. Um, well, I had one, one more question that is, um, uh, I mean, yeah, we talk, when discussing district cooling, there's a main, the main focus on energy efficiency that is uh, improving energy efficiency a lot. And of course, that can uh, uh, come into the district cooling system can be uh, achieved or put in buildings with building, in, utilizing build new building codes or energy efficiency targets. But another target or one other measure that uh, you know uh, high you know district cooling can achieve is of course to reduce refrigerants, because we all know also that refrigerants are. Uh, a, a real greenhouse has a, green, a very high greenhouse gas uh, potential. So, you th how do you think uh, utilizing the Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendment is that a way in as well for solutions like this to cooling to to uh, to to gain more grounds in in in, in India? Uh, definitely, the technology has the potential to bring in more natural refrigerants and, and low GWP refrigerants. I think that that is uh, also uh, an advantage. Uh, number two, uh, because of the more professional services, I mean, these are large units, so this is no longer being serviced by informal 
actually uh, untrained service technicians are this will be done in a professional way which also prevents leakages from happening so uh, that's one thing however the political uh, delineation between the Montreal Protocol uh, and let's say the um, uh, now Paris Agreement or uh, Glasgow, whatever, the, the, the climate uh, agreements and, and IPCC, UNFCCC, uh, it has always been uh, like this, that the Montreal Protocol, that's also why it is so successful. It is indeed exclusively, almost exclusively uh, focusing on the refrigerants with regard to the funding through the multilateral fund. Uh, energy efficiency, of course, now uh, is on the screen of all those who are involved, but still are, it's, let's say, not really part of the, of the funding. Um, so one needs to bring it in and it, it helps also to discuss it with the same agencies who are involved. Uh, because it is mainly the, the refrigeration and air conditioning sector, which is targeted on, uh, via the Montreal Protocol. So actually you have most of the actors involved, manufacturers as well as uh, the, the uh, uh, users. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, it's not so easy because there are phase out schedules in the Montreal Protocol, which are pre-agreed. And uh, along those lines, also then uh, the national measures are, are there. However, I can really say uh, the HFC uh, phase down, which has been agreed in the Kigali Amendment, um, it will become really an issue in the near future if people don't start to deploy other technologies as soon as possible. Because if we are now building up our, a huge pipeline of uh, equipment with HFCs, uh, the baseline for the HFC uh, phase down is, is pretty much low. And, and uh, we may actually very soon reach a level, I, I just mentioned in the beginning uh, that, that uh, on the answer, uh, that India has a very low penetration yet. If that penetration, let's say, doubles or triples in the next 10 years, are, I think those baselines which have been made under the Montreal Protocol for, for HFCs, they will not hold. And, and therefore, the sooner new uh, uh, refrigerants, natural refrigerants are being used in order to prevent more HFCs to come in, the better. And some support will be, is there from the Montreal Protocol, but it's not really from the financial side. That's, that's the issue. Oops, we lost Peter. We lost you for a moment, Peter. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I, I uh, had some issues here with the internet. Um, I think if... Thank you very much for uh, your uh, your answer there, Marcus. I think we should not forget about uh, re re the importance of refrigerants and, like you said here, you know, uh, keeping business as usual with uh, split units is is a is a no go when it comes to you know meeting the the, the, the growing cooling demand. So, so I think we we should not forget about re refrigerants when we discuss the rising cooling demands and also the importance of or the benefits that this cooling can add. So. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very I, much. I really, see, I really see a potential because our, the central cooling plant is not in the in the buildings. It, it is in a separate building in, in a separate space. So natural refrigerants can probably very much be used over there without any uh, risk for uh, those who actually uh, get the cooling, right? So one can really think of ammonia, uh, of hydrocarbons uh, in order to uh, produce the cool, uh, so to say. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And don't forget also that this cooling use significantly less refrigerant than uh, 
if you have split units uh, only. So, okay, thank you very much, Marcus, uh, for your contribution. Uh, stay with us if you have, uh, if you can. So, I would like to move to the next speaker. Um, I would like to move to Miss uh, Ritika Jain from the Shakti Foundation. Uh, the, uh, welcome, Ritika. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really nice to meet all of you here. And I'm going to keep my presentation very brief because um, a lot of the interesting points have been covered by the experts here today. Um, please let me know if it's uh, available, if it's visible or not. Not yet. And now? Um, not yet. No. Um, all right. I think it's uh, there's some trouble sharing my presentation. Is it possible, Anand, that you can share the presentation uh, that I sent this morning? And I can just um, talk until then. Give me a, give me a minute. I'll yeah. just... Sure. Yeah, you can take that time and I'll just uh, set the context a little bit. So uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of Shakti Foundation and I'm working as a senior program manager focusing on more most of the sustainable cooling initiatives at Shakti and uh, uh, Shakti's main goal is to facilitate India's uh, transition towards a cleaner energy future. And the idea is to facilitate a lot of policy discussions and understanding where, uh, where we can uh, intervene and have the implementation of some of the good, great policies that exist. And um, so looking at uh, different areas, uh, one of the primary areas that the, this uh, section comes under, cooling comes under, is energy efficiency. And apart from that, there is industrial decarbonization and green buildings that come as a, uh, in the larger picture that are at attached to this kind of topic where we're looking at reducing the energy demand from cooling. Um, as we've already spoken about, there's a lot of, uh, like cooling is a large uh, area which demands energy. So yeah, you can uh, move forward on into maybe the third slide or the fourth slide uh, in this. Yeah, further on. So I, I was just talking about the case for clean cooling and why uh, everyone here also agrees with that. And Shakti also wants to talk about green cooling or uh, addressing India's growing cooling needs. Because apart from the uh, obvious concerns like higher energy demand and stress on the existing electricity grid, um, there is also a, a very important point that needs to be addressed that we need to look at thermal comfort for all. And it is a development need. We have to look at productivity uh, and all of the other concerns that come with provision of cooling. So uh, air conditions being away, are still seen as more of a luxury product. Can we see if, can we see if there are other options for us to uh, access cooling at a better price or um, at, a more, at a more environmentally better price? Uh, price as well, where we can have these kind of models in place. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we are looking at uh, the India Cooling Action Plan. And of course, India has placed a lot of importance on cooling. And this action plan is a, is, is a, is a proof of that, that India is already looking at cooling as an important area. And uh, this plan is providing this 20-year perspective where we can make cooling sustainable and accessible for all. Shakti had supported uh, some of the technical expert committees that were working on different thematic tracks under the ICAP. And even the current work at Shakti parallels this vision of the ICAP where we would like to identify some early action opportunities for cooling efficiency, phasing down of these uh, GWP, high GWP refrigerants and strengthening the cooling ecosystem through knowledge sharing. Platforms like the India Cooling Coalition is being um, has been uh, started uh, with some of our support. And we want to promote uh, different areas under cooling on uh, clean cold chain infrastructure or refrigerant transition, et cetera. So moving on to the next slide. So the approach uh, that Shakti wants to take in this area is to uh, see where policy interventions that are aimed at reducing energy consumption for cooling, uh, where we can you know, come in and hold discussions to uh, intervene. How can some of the net zero building or clean cooling concepts be institutionalized and not just uh, sort of discussed and then there's no action really on them. 
And we're hoping for outcomes like wider market adoption of uh, some of these climate-friendly technologies and resource-efficient technologies in buildings and cooling methodologies. And the strategies that we have employed in the different projects that Shakti supports are to promote alternative cooling or not-in-kind technologies, uh, designing and uh, implementing innovative business models that Marcus had just spoken about in much detail, so I would not go further. But so looking at different initiatives that are trying to upscale these concepts and uh, uptake of energy efficient and net zero building concepts in the country. Uh, moving on to the next section, please. So I wanted to talk about district cooling in specific uh, uh, and some of the studies that Shakti has supported on this topic. Uh, if you could move on, uh, Anand, to the next slide. I won't go into the, uh, uh, you know, the definition, but of course, it is very much agree that it is a more efficient and uh, a system which is uh, better than on-site cooling for every little unit. And uh, going on to the next slide, Anand. Some of the studies that we, uh, there were a couple of studies that we supported on optimal cooling pathways for India and how the India Cooling Action Plan can be implemented, which talk about uh, district cooling as a promising technology, uh, uh, which will be uh, able to serve the growing needs of uh, in, in most in urban cities in India. Yeah, going on to the next slide, please. Uh, we've already talked about benefits and challenges in this discussion, but uh, apart from the obvious uh, benefits, I wanted to talk about some of the barriers, which is what uh, makes the uptake of district cooling a little difficult, and um, as was already discussed, but very high initial investment or setup costs are a hindrance. And then procurement of land to set up this kind of a facility and regulatory clearances, which we have discussed, are, of course, uh, one of the major uh, barriers that prevent district cooling from spreading faster. And uh, this is something which cannot be, uh, we'll stay on the same slide for a little bit, just to talk about retrofitting versus new development. And that's obvious that uh, this kind of development needs to have a complete development plan right from the beginning. And we cannot think of it as an afterthought. And uh, it needs to align with the city plans from the very beginning. Um, that's, the, that's one of the ways that we can think about taking district cooling up. And of course, there are ownership issues and how people are willing to share the risk, the trust factor that comes in. And once one of the once we see some successful models, like in the next slide that I was going to talk about on uh, Give City again very briefly, that this is one way that we can instill confidence in this kind of a technology or system. Yeah, Anand, we can move to the next slide, please. Next uh, after this, please. So uh, district cooling is mostly, uh, it is suggested that it is better taken up in mixed use areas which have high cooling demand densities. So some of the good models or areas to support district cooling would be in smart cities or industry hubs or university campuses where there is, uh, where there is a major demand and you know, a, like a centralized facility can serve these areas to see some of the successful models in India. And already that is happening. It's good to see that uh, guidelines are also coming out and uh, all the people here are working to make uh, some of these models a success. Yeah, uh, going on. So just in a brief, like last takeaways from uh, what I wanted to convey was that uh, the, the way forward we feel at Shakti is that uh, developing integrated policy frameworks uh, to achieve the so-called vision that we have for in India, for, the, for India of the future, is, has to come right from the design stage. So we need to engage with municipalities, utilities, and developers from the beginning, and uh, we need to see, yeah, where where the missing links are, so that it's uh, everyone's on board. And uh, of course, there's a need for appropriate business models, having a conducive environment so that we can attract the right organizations, have the right technical expertise that suits India and India's unique, uh, you know, requirements and how can cooling as a service become a successful model? So these are some of the things that uh, come to mind when talking about district cooling, and it is it is a priority action area for Shakti, and uh, would be happy to support and discuss some projects that are out there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Ritika, for that interesting presentation. Uh, yeah, it just shows you know the scale of. 
uh, what work has to be done to address or support cities, uh, not, you know, not only to develop busy cooling, but I mean, to really help them um, in meeting the, you know, the, the growing cooling demand and help them to choose the best solutions. Because in the end, you know, we, we, um, we really have to change uh, the way we do. And we have to, th I think one important thing is, you know, to, uh, inter you, I mean, you mentioned about the importance of urban planning. It means that the, there's a great need to collaborate more between different, um, all the actors involved in, in our cities have to sit together and, and, and meet and discuss uh, the best solutions for the city. Thank you very much, Ritika. I was told that I should, we're a little bit uh, late in the, in the, in the schedule. So, uh, we, we, if we have time, we will come back to you, Ritika. Uh, but I will want to move on to the next speaker, Mr. I want to uh, uh, Mr. Ganesh Das from TPDDL to to join us and uh, uh, introduce yourself and maybe give us some update on on uh, how you are working with district cooling in in India. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants. Uh, you know, I look after the strategy, collaboration, innovation, R&D at the Tata Bar Daily Distribution and also head the Clean Energy International Innovation Center as its CEO. So we have been, uh, you know, uh, not very kind of uh, experienced in the space of district cooling, but we are quite experienced in the space of distribution. So uh, what we really see a transformation, there is a, there are some slides which I will just maybe share. Are you able to see the slides? Not yet. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, yes. Just trying to put it in the presentation mode. Yeah. So, so what we are trying to do is uh, we we actually our job is to distribute electricity, and when it comes to distribution electricity. What is happening in India, predominantly if you see that the utilities are getting into the space of electric vehicles, you know, we have started not only stopping our action at the meter level, but we are actually moving beyond the meter. We are actually working with the consumer to figure out that how energy is going to be used, used efficiently. And that was something which we had done. We have started working with them on the demand response. We have started working with consumers on the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So what, what all this is doing is we are crossing the meter and then help working at the edge of the meter to define different applications. And district tooling is going to be a huge, uh, we feel it is going to make a significant difference in the entire uh, you know, ball game. The reason for that is, if I give an example, if you typically look at the curve in Delhi, a summer curve in Delhi, we hit peak twice a day. Once it happens in the afternoon, when the commercial peak is uh, there and the one which happens in the night, when the domestic peak is there. And in both the cases, the peak is due to the air conditioning. And it is huge, you know, the, the, the I mean, just to give a illustration, if there is a 2000, uh, you know, megawatt is the peak, sometimes which we touch, the off peak is somewhere, it touches something like 1200, 1300, you know, there's a huge difference between the peak and off peak. And this creates a lot of stress in the grid. So the balancing of the grid becomes a challenge, managing, the, you know, uh, the, the, the load, the supply and demand is becomes a challenge. We have got some electric energy storage system in place, but that is not sufficient to really balance this kind of a load because it is not cost effective at all. So how do we really work around to look at a cost effective solutions with respect to cooling? And apart from that, there is a huge energy consumption, you know, 30, 40 percent energy consumption could be saved. And, and if you really have a very efficient cooling system, especially in, in Delhi. And one of the things which happens in, in uh, Delhi is, you know, you will have a uh, very hot summer which is totally dry then you have a summer which is hot but there is it's very humid so there is a variability when it comes to the season also whatever difference whatever different combination combination you will have it happens there so create sustainable society important aspects so it is not only the business case we are looking at how do we are sustainable how do we make saving saving fossil fuel local generating employment again one aspect and deferring investment in the in the power uh, generation uh, area and if you look at some of the stakeholders, you have got government institution on one side, and then you have got the project implementer, and you have got the financiers, facilitators. You know, this is something which is very different from the experience of a typical distribution. 
but here we have got a, a real you know we have got like in the case of electric vehicle you have got transport department coming in the highways coming in similarly here also you have got ministry of power finance housing urban development the building construction player the cpwd everybody is there and then you got project architects coming in to design sustainable uh, designs of building and also the facilities and then the financial institution has got a opportunity to invest in a, in a totally different kind of a setup and why this is important because individual consumer investment for air conditioning and other things you know does not really uh, you know kind of encourage or make a market and it becomes very fragmented market when you are having small small players investing in different technology but when you have something very big happening then it really generates interest at the financial market level uh, you know technology experts knowledge partners would come in and then industry would also partner take a take a case an example if you are looking at a symbiotic industrial township which i feel is going to be something which india is going to see very very uh, you know not so uh, far in the future a, a set of all people coming together creating a relationship in such a fashion that you have a common cooling system wherein you start using each others you know uh, outputs also in in one way or the other is something which is interesting to look at uh, on that and some of the challenges for implementing in dcs again uh, policies technology finance and then the lack of awareness from the commercial and the commercial viability which we talk about and if you took it from the understanding point of view you have got very few players who really understand the concept of district cooling you know uh, i was i was listening that we we uh, we relate to cooling into multiple things you know uh, from the technology standpoint what exactly comprises of a efficient community society based district cooling is something we need to look at that is something sort of a challenge which is always there this you know our my friend marcus said talked about it it's a summary of this slide what exactly you know uh, the kind of business model is in offering and then what kind of a risk and what kind of a return on this and largely if you look at this uh, you know you can really find out you know if you want to have a less risky model you can look at that if you want to have a high risk high return then this is also going to be looked at but eventually you know everything will succeed you know all stimulus any new projects would start from a government stimulus but eventually it has to be taken over by the private player uh, larger you know smaller players also so that it becomes more sustainable and it generates better employment and it really accepts and really fluctuates and and brings in the elasticity of uh, you know price in in the in the whole uh, game so uh, some of this again uh, this is i will not spend too much time some of the estimated benefits uh, on electric chiller then then uh, stringent chiller some free cooling from river i mean a lot of uh, you know estimates are there there is a, again there is a source which has been mentioned here but i think we have to little bit wait for some more time to look at this from the indian perspective that how really these kind of benefits transform and from the distribution uh, player standard cooling system in india a lot of things there is a whole lot of uh, players who have really looked at in a very serious manner we heard reji and other speakers also speak about it but it's what the key thing is when we start looking at a community when we start looking at an housing development system in the requirement of district cooling and what it does you know let me also give a perspective you know affordability of a electric uh, you know or an air conditioner is very difficult and the quality of the life gets affected very drastically if you compare with what is seen in in the other other countries especially the developed world the heating and cooling is largely done at a very significant central level so that also gives and the utility also plays a big role Whereas in India, those kind of things are not there. The affordability by of a common man to improve the quality of life, especially in the extreme heat and the kind of challenges which is there in the Indian, I think it is not only a responsibility from the from the energy efficiency point of view, but I think there is a responsibility from the social point of view, from a moral point of view, also to make sure that the quality of the people who are working indoor and at least some people who work outdoor and come back to the indoor also improves by having a cost-effective system which is affordable. so uh, some of the use cases you know we also looked at a, a, a small uh, you know use case in our our uh, ecosystem we looked at a substation we looked at a district cooling power potential and we and we looked at whether it is going to help us to fatten the load curve in the summer uh, thermal storage during off peak uh, reduction of the total demand uh, so increasing revenue of through implementation decreasing the residential customers demand thereby reducing cross subsidy here interestingly what happens is 
residential consumers are subsidized by the industrial commercial consumer they pay for the residential customer this can help to reduce that subsidy and also possibly uh, help the government to look at the cross subsidies also in a, in a different way better network management because you are not looking at a pole wherein suddenly the load gets spurt up you can actually design the district pool as part of your network that is something which we see as a very effective thing some of the perspectives of dcs from the tata power ddl point of view uh, you see that at the moment the return on investment is capped for utilities you know essentially uh, you know we have a rate of return and again there are a lot of stories and, and there is a lot of facts around the fact that the challenges faced by the distribution companies in india utility has to reach last mile uh, to ensure coverage uh, and pro your proper support system customers uh, trust in terms to be a really a participant and investor in this kind of a project you need to have a mapping uh, uh, map the using the gis infrastructure map your assets in a very appropriate manner uh, you know the existing metering billing and collection system in place uh, which is helping us to reduce capex and system utilities have a better insight of the growth which is happening in these cities so therefore a better planning could be done if utility plays a role with, with the uh, development of a dc system along with the municipality or any of the body which is going to do that and utilities are also looking at new areas of growth because the tariff does not increase there is a challenges in the distribution returns so this could be something which help the utility also to have a better sustainability when it comes to business so there is some element of policy advocacy everything need to be required to do that so i'll i'll stop here this is what i i had to share i'll be very happy to provide some more clarification on the thoughts which i just expressed thank you very much thank you very much uh, ganesh that for that very comprehensive presentation on on the cycling in india i think it was very interesting highlighting many different things and um so just a quick question here i know we were we are a little bit behind the schedule but so in terms of um i mean business models and and different uh, uh, types of project constellations there uh, maybe you can highlight uh, again the importance of let's say the private um how the you know the private developers play an important role or private investment in, in investors plays an important role the, when developing uh these cooling systems so so what happens is you know the utility space a big role because they understand the landscape very well you know in the so the constraints when it comes to from where the power is going to be paid available etc for do that and industry also you know the whole idea is to, if you typically look at the 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 financing today you know the industry pays every month for the electricity bill and so on and so forth if we come out with a model where we could get somebody to finance the way do it for the esco uh, model where where we could get a financer coming in the larger industry coming in and saying that i am going to invest upfront in the technology and then subsequently this could be adjusted in some uh, way in my electricity bills etc for doing that i mean i don't even i i, I don't i am even open to say that if with a utility if a large industry is existing with a utility a large industry can set up the district cooling system and then make it very easy for the you know managing the entire thing. there could be always an agreement to look at and and once the what interesting i feel about the entire game is the moment you have one or two cases you will suddenly find that lot of innovative thinkers would come in and they will offer different financial models to really make it much easier to do yeah thank you very much okay thank you there was a very uh, good presentation very comprehensive uh, and uh, i th- we are i have to move to the next speaker so but stick around and let's see if we have any time left for for further questions uh, thank you uh okay so i will would like to move to mr rajiv charma uh, are you there oh yes peter yeah uh from gift city so uh, i would like to give the floor to you to uh Uh, I don't know if you have a presentation or if you would like to introduce um I think Gift City and I mean it's a really good uh, case study of a uh, successful district cooling development in India and maybe you can share a little bit about yourself and the project Amagos uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for on on this uh, forum and thank you for to Mr. Prajeep Pillai and all my colleagues with whom we regularly most of us are known to each other so today was a nice uh, and and a very wonderful day 
where many presentations were very useful. Uh, normally, you know, we all teach each other what district holding is, and towards the end, we all go out. And here, everybody is an expert on district holding. So nobody wants to, nobody needs to be knowing more on this district coding. So I would refrain from talking more on district coding today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have been seeing and talking on these webinars more and more. And more is my, my, my insight, which is saying, that's fine. We all know district coding. We all know the challenges. We all know everything, almost everything that we talk in common. But what do we do today is what my, my mind keeps talking to me. And so I think one, one thing which has happened very good is that Arjit's presentation was something in the same direction. And then Marcos spoke on almost a similar thing on the policy. So, so in general, if somebody wants to uh, ask me what are my key concerns on, on district cooling, there are five Ps on which I have shared my overall view on the district cooling. The first P is policy. We must have a policy. So Arjit and team and Marcos, they are doing a wonderful job. And I would really appreciate that. That's the first thing. The second is power. Power is 80% of the business. So uh, we need to look into how the power can be uh, provided to district cooling users. And it's a big topic. There's no point in talking to on, on that subject. Then the third is production. Production is like, is there enough load where a district cooling plant can provide and generate because there is a break-even point requirement. So for a 10,000 ton plant, day one, you should have 25% of load. And YOY, not less than 20% load is required. If less than that, you would not have your break-even. If more than that, you can have a break-even in about five years. And overall break-even in about seven years. That's only an OPEX problem. And then, next P is provider. So provider of technology, we are missing. We don't have. Provider of equipment, we don't have. Provider of service providers, we are lacking again. And fund providers, yes. So all these providers need to be found out. And, and they have to be <clears throat> brought on a, on a platform. While we keep saying we need to do district cooling, the groundwork is still pending to be done. We are doing district cooling, that's fine. But you know, how do we take Gift City to the map of India? Hardly people know in Delhi what Gift City is. Hardly, I can tell you. I was just speaking to EIL last week. They didn't know what gift city is. Can you believe it? EIL is one of the largest. And then many other people that I've spoken to them. So, and the last thing is planning or positioning. Planning is very, very important on all levels. Every day we, we do our planning. Almost every week we review it. It is so important. So these five P's does the main challenges for the district. I'll stop there. And one thing which is very important today, I want to add through your uh, forum, is what I feel today is that uh, what Arjit is doing and Marcus is doing, on somewhere there, we should have a website called District Pooling Website. And that should be for India. And people like you should be there available to write articles. Informative journals should be introduced on that website. Uh, then we should get good consultants on board. We are still looking at Gift City for good consultants. Maybe I'll come to you uh, separately on that. I've spoken to Marcus. Then we need to bring suppliers or, of goods, large plants, uh, suppliers, large machine suppliers, large pipe suppliers, large wall suppliers. It is so difficult to find them today in India. So those suppliers should be brought on that website. Then we should identify a couple of projects in India and put them on site with more details and more challenges so that people should know, know what is happening in India. Only we talk amongst ourselves, there are six projects, five projects, yes, city. But, but where is the customer? We are not reaching our people who should listen to us. So that is what we should do. Then identify also good projects in Asia, not only in India, like in Singapore in other countries, and some forum should be made to introduce these projects once time and again on regular basis, uh, people talking to, uh, to everyone on, on, on those lines. Then uh, we should set up an eligible 
available team of members who are eligible members to answer the questions of of uh, builders, developers who would like to know more about district cooling. We are only talking about district cooling. But we should be able to provide information. And then once the policy is there, we should upload the policy also there. But there would be definitely more questions. So eligible members should be there to answer and promote district cooling through that website. And then we should find out pilot projects. As I think Arjit has said, we should find out pilot projects to, to fund the pilot projects and do some projects. Seeing is believing. And regular visits to projects like Gift City can also get confidence to people that, yes, a place like a post office, a office section, a residential section, hospital, university, fire station, everything, uh, a club, a you know, we can we can do it. And, and it is good to see while things are being uh, in the making. That will give more confidence. It's not suddenly that somebody comes and sees everything ready. So they should see that. Then information on upcoming projects like, you know, uh, um, gentleman uh, he, from UN, Rahul, he said that there is a project coming up and we did not have any information. So those, those informations, whoever has it, uh, we should have them. Then there should be a forum which should be strong enough, including Arjit and team, to reach the government, talking on larger issues of power, uh, power concessions, concession for district cooling for first five years. We will not be able to sustain if we run the commercial uh, ta commercial electricity tariff on the district cooling supplying residential. It is not a sustainable possibility. So that is what we should do. Then what I am doing here, and I think what we can also do is, I am trying to engage universities here in district cooling. I'm bringing them here and trying to bring young PhD students to work on various issues. There's too much to be done. We are still scratching the surface. There is so much more to be done. So we should engage universities in that and let them do research. So, you know, it will improve the, the, the feasibility and, and not only just trying to photocopy each other's project, keep innovating new things. Uh, then I think uh, new technologies will come that way. And last is that the, the, the major developers like, you know, Adani, Tata, I don't want to take names, but you know, these are the key developers. They are key intelligent developers. They can be looped into and, and, and be created as a part of the forum to be convinced to start something. And I think there is where we will be able to open up the window in India for the district. Forums are definitely workable. It is good. But then, you know, the, my, my, what I'm saying is, what today? What should we do today? So we should have a very strong plan. What is to be done today, tomorrow, day after, next week, something like that. And all intelligent people here should be able to contribute uh, religiously. On that. I think that's what concluded. Thank you for hearing me. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for that, Rajiv. Uh, very uh, many interesting thoughts that you have. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a great idea to create a district cooling portal or website um, focusing on India um, and, and, and be a portal to, to learn more about district cooling, to learn more about projects, to learn more about different issues related to, to district cooling. I mean, I can just say from uh, APUA and what we do, we, <clears throat> we we do, of course, a similar thing for the Asia-Pacific region. So we try to be that platform. But of course, uh, I think we will be happy to support uh, an Indian platform like this uh, as well. So that, it sounds great. Thank okay. you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I want to move on to the last uh, speaker uh, today. Uh, Pramit Gupta, uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, and uh, I just will give the floor to you to, st to start uh, maybe introducing yourself and uh, briefly. Thank you very much. I think you're muted. Hi, thank you, Peter, for having me here. So uh, I represent the Breed. We are a Middle East based uh, district cooling utility. We have been actively pursuing uh, district cooling uh, objectives, business objectives in India for the last two years. Uh, 
lot of public concessions also we are pursuing. Uh, one of the first public concessions of the country, which was the Amravati city concession, which was touched in this discussion earlier, is was awarded to us uh, a 20,000 tons uh, uh, district pooling scheme, which was supposed to cool the entire uh, upcoming city government district area. And at the same time, with that being said, we are happy to see a lot of other cities, smart cities, industrial parks now coming up, uh, uh, integrating district cooling and launching RFPs, inviting uh, people like us to invest, uh, consider, and you know even uh, even ask ask for support in integrating DCS, bringing in our best practices from the Middle East to India. Uh, to integrate within the uh, master plan. And uh, uh, we are very happy to also see a very good traction in the private sector development, where uh, a lot of, lot of you know, act, act, act activity and action is ongoing in the emerging cities, the new cities like Hyderabad, the IT hubs, uh, the suburban hubs which are developing across Bangalore, Chennai, even Mumbai, in Navi Mumbai. So a lot of private developers are taking the lead in integrating, you know, uh, a central cooling concept in their larger master plan. Mixed use master plans now are uh, for sure getting the, you know, the the attention of a central cooling, a sustainable cooling system where it is. It, it was long due, I'll say. Uh, the industry you know, we are very happy has realized, and uh, it's a good mix now. Uh, the public sector also adopting the district cooling. Uh, at large and private sector all, already there were in one of the last slides we just saw uh, of the seven eight uh, larger district cooling schemes private sector leads the way right thank you Pramit. um i also know that uh, uh, that tabreed has recently announced an investment with the ifc international finance corporation um right for a, a very large investment to set up a cooling platform in India. Maybe you can, can you share more about this investment? Yes. So along with, uh, along with uh, uh, Tabreed, who is very bullish on this sector in India, and we see great potential of the entire district energy segment here. Uh, we have already partnered previously with, uh, you know, we have helped uh, the Mohua Smart Cities Department. We have already signed an MOU with EESL, uh, to explore uh, district energy projects. Uh, this comes at a very right time. Uh, World Bank, IFC shares a common view. They are also very bullish. This is the sustainable energy business of the future. India being in the tropical zone and it needs cooling pretty much. Nearly all the larger cities in the need of cooling for a larger part of the year. And, uh, you know, the move towards uh, net zero now starting with there being a deadline in place and ways and means people are searching to adopt to move towards that target sustainability and efficiency in cooling becomes a very important uh, ball game for the developers here so along with us ifc came on very strongly and they want uh, to pursue this they are very bullish on the sector they share the same uh, uh, sentiment as us uh, that this is a business that is required and this is a business that will be, uh, although India has is slow in the beginning, but it is something that will be uh, started very strongly in the years to come. So we have set up a platform. Uh, we, in the next four years, uh, uh, have a development pipeline. We wish to convert around 100,000 tons of uh, uh, that into like uh, like an investment opportunity with IFC. IFC come in uh, on board as a significant minority shareholder. And we are keen to, on this 100,000, 120 odd thousand uh, uh, pooling capacity that we want to invest in across six or seven major cities. We, we have plans to deploy around up to $400 million in the next four years uh, on, on this uh, district cooling infrastructure. And where, as a partner, we get we gain from IFC's insights into the financial markets, and we bring in strong credibility of being a, a partner of choice in district cooling for over two decades in the Middle East, and we bring our credentials as an able and a reliable uh, developer and a ut cooling utility provider on the table. Are, are there any specific uh, 
target cities for this project? Or uh, can you elaborate on that? So our key primary target is the uh, private sector, uh, uh, public sector, smart cities as well. Uh, it remains a very core focus. Uh, but a key uh, target area that we are looking at is uh, uh, the private real estate sector uh, where the developers are creating the IT SEZs and the IT, IT commercial sector, the office sector is one of the largest consumers of cooling as such. Uh, so India as per our brief assessment, has a sizable installed uh, cooling potential, which could have been, you know, well addressed through a uh, district cooling means, but we are late now, like over the last 10 years. But India has the potential to nearly double or go 2.5 times in the next decade in the same private development sector. Uh, so that remains a very key to us. And uh, when we say of district cooling, we try to partner with private real estate developers in their campuses or their mixed use developments through a cooling as a service model. Uh, so it could, it could be either the greenfield, uh, it could be either a greenfield development or an operational development where we deploy our cooling as a service model, uh, tried and tested in the Middle East, uh, which is also prevalent in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia as well through our shareholder NG. Uh, so we bring the cooling as a service model to the private players where we take care, we come on board as a strategic cooling services partner. And in this IT commercial or IT SEZs or office sector developments, we provide them uh, with a sustainable KPI based, efficient and reliable continuous cooling uh, where, you know, the developer partner, you know, gets off his head the entire hassle of and the risk of maintaining the cooling part, the infrastructure, maintaining the efficiency day in, day out. That is something that, that is we, we have been doing very beautifully in the Middle East, and we want to deploy the systems here. So that, uh, that is a very core focus area for us. And of course, as and when our cities grow, uh, the larger cities in, in the term of what we call as merchant district cooling, the smart cities, uh, start planning these uh, systems like we have in GIFT, what is coming up in Rajkot, what is coming up in Hyderabad Pharma City, or what has been adopted in Amaravati, which is now on hold. So that is something we will always be ready to participate in and keen to you know, invest on. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> uh, if anyone in the audience or anyone are interested to learn more or contact uh, this initiative, Tabrid, uh, can they reach out to you to look to uh, sure. look into possibilities? Sure. Yeah, sure. definitely. Okay, um, that sounds great. And uh, yeah, so and, and just briefly here, can you mention some? I mean, how when you when you approach real estate developers and how how do you convince them that this cooling is a, is a, is the best choice for them? So, so, so we bring in, you know, concepts and we show it to them on, on paper how a better design can work. Uh, but these larger developers, they have, you know, a lot, large amount of data available with them over the last 10 years. You take any good top private developers and they will instantly know uh, that one point that they regularly struggle is on the cooling services where whatever, even on a conventional manner, whatever the design intent was, has not been met. And, you know, uh, this is one drain on their finances and a very, you know, a big hassle on the uh, continuous operation, sustainable operations of their buildings. Uh, so uh, this data is readily available to them. And when they start comparing what can happen and, you know, how a, how a credible uh, partner who comes on board uh, can actually mitigate that, bring in technologies. So we have a very active R&D cell. Uh, uh, we, as, a, as a utility as well, uh, while we are agnostic on the OEM, OEM and the technologies, uh, we have a very active R&D cell who keeps on working out across the 86 district cooling plants we have across four to five countries. What works, which situation is, you know, what, what data uh, we have, what are the loads, what, what kinds of systems work, what is the kind of technology that could be deployed? So in a very bespoke way, we try to help this through with the developers. And 
make them see through the difference between what has been applied in their own developments and what could be the case for a centralized. It could not be a district cooling plant always. It could be like a centralized cooling plant or a campus cooling plant as well. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, you have, uh, did you say you, you, you run or own 86 district cooling uh, projects? Uh, right. in the, is it mostly in the Middle East? Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. So and and quite uh, like we we expect to increase that number very soon in India as well. Uh, right. As I yeah. mentioned, together with our shareholder, we plan to uh, have a portfolio of around hundred thousand tons of cooling in mm. by twenty five twenty six uh, two thousand twenty six. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as as this cooling has great potential in India, definitely. Uh, permit, permit. Maybe you can uh, share your email in the chat to if sure. if people want to contact you and uh, look into some opportunities. Or uh, yes, we are running out of time, so I think I have to end the session here. Or permit, do you have anything you would like to add? That's all, Peter. Thanks a lot. Okay. For Thank you, thank you very much, Pamit, and thank you very much, uh, all the, the 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 panelists 